Good, Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Happy, Happy to see all of you friends, friends and those, those of you joining us online. Uh, welcome. Uh, we are today uh, worshiping on Transfiguration Sunday. It's our last Sunday before we begin the sun Sunday or the weeks of Lent. So. Uh, grateful to have all of you here with us. If you are here in the sanctuary, would you take just a moment, find that friendship pad, sign that, and send it the length of your pew? Well, I want to offer a heartfelt thanks to um, Jen and the students and musicians last week, I, uh, which is uh, really sad that um, my vacation plans overlapped with uh, Youth Sunday, but I'm so grateful for the ways in which they led you in worship and... Uh, we, uh, our future is in good hands with our young people. So if you are a newcomer among us today, we especially want to welcome you. And if you are without a church home at this time, I hope that you'll find a home right here at Valley Church. Um, let's all gather together after worship today, upstairs in Davis Hall for a time of coffee and fellowship, a chance to get acquainted. I hope you'll join me this morning in uh, welcoming back uh, Deborah Young, who is joining us uh, as our pianist this morning in Thomas's absence. So welcome, Deborah. Great to have you with us again. After worship today, I hope that you will beat a path down to the Gamble Library for the 56th birthday of our library. Uh, it's immediately following worship. Uh, join in the fun, check out a book or two, and uh, also, rumor has it that there will be cake, so it's a good place to go. Uh, just to let you know, the church office will be closed tomorrow in observance of President's Day, but open again on Tuesday, so just wanted you to know that. Uh, next Sunday, our session is called for our annual congregational meeting. That's next Sunday, the 26th at 11 o'clock, right after worship. Uh, the, the meeting, meeting will be held in the sanctuary right here and will be live streamed for those of you that are unable to be present in person. During this meeting, a session will offer uh, the reports of uh, plans for living into our renewed vision uh, during 2023. We'll receive our financial report for 2022 and review our budget for 2023. Uh, you'll also be hearing from the Congregational Nominating Committee as they will speak to you about the upcoming Pastor Nominating Committee and explain that process to you. So I hope you'll join us. It'll be, um, I think, an informative meeting and an important one as we look toward the future. So join us next Sunday. Next Sunday, we will uh, begin uh, the Sundays of Lent, and uh, this is our a period of time for spiritual reflection and preparation for this uh, celebration of Easter. Uh, but we do begin, actually, as you probably all know, on Ash Wednesday, which is this coming Wednesday, believe it or not, the 22nd. We'll be um, having a special Ash Wednesday service in the evening at 7 o'clock right here in the sanctuary. Uh, Pastor Jenny and I will be leading that service together, and uh, it'll be a time of some special music, prayers, a message, and the imposition of ashes as we remember that we are but dust, and to dust we all shall return one day. It'll be a time of reflecting uh, on our mortality and our need for a Savior. So I hope that you'll come and join us as we begin Lent together. Our Lenten sermon series it will be entitled Meeting Jesus at the Table, uh, as I said, we'll begin that next Sunday, and uh, each week we'll be considering familiar, familiar stories from the Gospels that have to do with Jesus sharing in meals with individuals and groups of people. Through these stories, we'll be reflecting on our call uh, from Christ to love, to serve, and expand uh, God's gracious hospitality to others. So I hope you'll join us for that. Lots, Lots of other, other announcements, announcements in your bulletin, bulletin today. I'll leave those for you to read on your own. But let's, at this time, prepare our hearts to worship God.
Good, Good morning. morning. Oh, sing, oh, sing to, to the Lord, Lord a new song. song. Sing, sing to the Lord, Lord all the earth. Please, Please stand. stand. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Let us worship God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we confess to you our waywardness and our sin. Your world confronts us with our great need of you, yet we act as if we can live on our own. You call us to be those who not only hear your word, but put it into practice. Yet so often we listen without being changed. Forgive us. By the Spirit's power, give us new hearts that we might worship you and serve you with our whole being. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.
stand. The Apostle Paul puts it this way, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Believe and now live the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made new. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you. Please greet those around you. As we come now to our time to hear from God's holy word, let's take just a moment and gather ourselves in prayer. Will you pray with me? Oh, gracious God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us ears to hear the message you intend for us today through your word read and proclaimed and set us on your path of righteousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, there's a cartoon that is taped to the door of the building inspector of the Ada, Michigan Township. And this cartoon shows the imagined construction site for the Tower of Pisa in Italy, you know. Uh, that would be the leaning Tower of Pisa? Okay. So in the cartoon, the tower is standing straight up as they're building it. 
Uh, but the construction foreman uh, in the cartoon is whispering to the architect. And this is what he's whispering to the architect. You know, I saved a little money on the foundation. But don't worry, no one will ever notice. Well, we noticed. <laughs> Roughly 850 years later, the building is leaning and without uh, considerable modern engineering could fall over. Now the tower doesn't lean because of poor design of the tower itself. Uh, it doesn't lean because of poor workmanship. It doesn't lean because it was made of an inferior grade of marble. No, it leans for only one reason. It leans because it was built on an inadequate foundation. It was built on ground made of clay and sand and shells in an area with a very shallow water table. The leaning tower of Pisa leans because it was not built on a firm foundation. And I think we would all agree this morning that foundations are important. Jesus certainly thought so. Uh, this morning as we conclude our winter uh, sermon series, Follow the Call, we're going to be considering the last few verses of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Verses in which Jesus speaks of the importance of foundations, solid enough to build our individual and collective lives upon. So let's turn now to our text, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 24 to 29. And together, let's listen for God to speak. Jesus said, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Luke and Owen and Sienna. Beautiful. It's one of those Sundays where I feel like maybe I don't need to preach. That preaches well. <laughs> but I will. <laughs> For the last six weeks, uh, as we've explored the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew's Gospel, and we've considered together what it means for us both individually and collectively to respond in faith in obedience to the call of Jesus. This call of Jesus to follow him. We've considered what it means to live in the reign of God, in the kingdom of God, not just in heaven, but right now, right here on earth. Today, we find ourselves at the end of Jesus' sermon. You know, it's been said that a good sermon ending should include a story and a summons, a summons, a story and a summons that clearly answer the question, okay, now what? Using this definition, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount has a very good ending. Uh, it, it contains both a story and a summons for all those who have ears to hear. Jesus' concluding story really is a parable, one of the very first parables that we discover in the gospel according to Matthew. It is the parable of the wise and foolish builders. Now, as parables go, uh, the parable of the wise and foolish builders is pretty straightforward, actually. Even young children get the point when they sing that old Sunday school song, Wise Man Built His House Upon the Rock. Now, I know there's an earworm that's starting throughout the congregation right now. You're singing it to yourself, I'm sure. Um, one New Testament scholar has rightly observed this about this parable. There is no mystery in understanding this parable. First, we hear of a person who both hears and practices or does what Jesus has said in the sermon. Second, we hear of a person who hears but does not put into practice the sermon's teachings. The parable suggests that the first person is wise. The second person is a fool, totally unprepared when buffeted by the inevitable storms of life that collapse the fool's sandy foundation self-constructed life. 
Again, there is no mystery in understanding this parable. But it is helpful, I think, to remember the purpose of parables, the parables that Jesus taught. Jesus is not simply concluding his sermon with a parabolic story as a way of signaling to the gathered crowd that he's done and that they're now released to go and greet their neighbors, shake Jesus' hand at the door and comment on what a fine sermon he's delivered and then make their way to the first century equivalent of coffee fellowship time. No. (laughs) Parables have been described as, wait for it, megaphones. Megaphones that allow God to break through our spiritual deafness. Parables are intended to enable hearing and move listeners to response, a response. Jesus' parables through their vivid imagery and surprising twists and turns are meant to stop us in our tracks and summon us to consider one overriding question. Now that I've heard Jesus' words, what must I do to make them the foundation of how I live? Now that I've heard, what should I do? Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of the opening words of our passage for today from the message capture so well the summons that is contained in the parable of the wise and foolish builders. It reads, these words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build your life on. Words to build your life on. Friends, with the words of the Sermon on the Mount, and especially the words of this closing parable, Jesus is summoning us. Jesus is summoning us to build a life. A life, as Bonhoeffer has so accurately described, a life that is exclusively attached to Jesus and his kingdom. A life built on hearing and acting upon Jesus' words. You see, in the Old Testament, hearing and doing were considered to be synonymous. You couldn't differentiate one from the other. It would have been inconceivable to Jesus that one could hear his words and not act upon them. It's also important to note that the Greek words in our text for this morning for both hearing and doing are in the present tense which means that hearing and doing are not temporary or occasional activities. No, they are continual, ongoing activities. The building blocks, if you will, of a faithful kingdom life. In summoning us to a life built on continually hearing and acting upon his words, Jesus makes clear that it's not enough to simply hear his words. Not enough. Jesus does not give us the option of admiring his words from afar, operating somewhat like spectators on the sidelines of of the kingdom of God. Bonhoeffer, again, in The Cost of Discipleship, says this, Jesus does not allow his hearers to go away and make of his sayings what they will picking and choosing from whatever they find helpful and testing them to see if they work. No. Jesus summons us to hear and act on his words, to practice them, to live them in our everyday lives, to follow him by imitating him, doing what he has modeled both in word and in deed. Later in the New Testament, James will say roughly the same thing in the first chapter of the book of James, and it reads this way. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. 
But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers that act, they will be blessed in their doing. See, there's one word in this passage from James chapter 1 that is particularly important for us today, and it's that word, persevere. We've heard that word before in our consideration of the Sermon on the Mount. Do you remember back in Matthew chapter 5 at verse 48, that seemingly impossible set of words of Jesus where he says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And in hearing these words, we wondered together, how can any of us flawed, mere mortals, ever be perfect? How can we live up to what feels like an impossibly high standard? It would be impossible if we were being called to perfection as in never making a mistake. But remember, remember what we learned. We learned that Jesus was really calling us to persevere, to persist, to persistent engagement in a lifelong process of becoming day by day more the people our Lord intends us to be. Through the parable of the wise and foolish builders, Jesus is calling us to persevere. To persist in a lifestyle of hearing and acting upon the words that he has shared with us. And in so doing, to build a foundation that will withstand even the most substantial storms of life. Even as I say these words, I mean, we understand, of course, that followers of Jesus are not immune from the storms of life. And how silly of me to even say that, because as I look around this sanctuary, I know that many of you have endured challenging seasons of storm and stress. Some of you are even in the thick of it right now. None of us are immune, are we? The challenge, of course, is building our foundation of persistent hearing and doing before the storms hit. The foundation of stone is built most often through years of hearing and acting upon, practicing the words of Jesus. It is hard to build anything once the storm is upon us. I mean, have you ever tried to carry a sheet of plywood in high wind? I mean, you know what I mean. The time to build is before the storm begins. And now a story. I want to share the story of some fellow Presbyterians. A fellow Presbyterian congregation that built a solid foundation of hearing and doing, persevering and practicing the words of Jesus before and during years of unimaginably challenging storms. I doubt if many of you have ever heard of Pastor Ibrahim Nasir and his church, uh, the National Presbyterian Church of Aleppo, Aleppo, Syria. But here's their story. For over 12 years, many of you know, Syria has been involved in uh, war, warfare, a complex civil war that has created the world's largest refugee crisis with 13 million, let that number sink in, 13 million people displaced, 6.7 million forced to flee Syria. Many of those who have fled uh, are Christians. Many have fled this primarily Muslim uh, nation fearing for their safety. But some Christians remain. Of the total populace, maybe two or three percent are Christian. The National Presbyterian Church in Aleppo has a long and beautiful history. It was organized by missionaries back in 1853, and we thought we were old. I mean, come on. 
Through its years of existence in Aleppo, uh, this congregation has given consistent witness to the love and grace and peace of Jesus Christ. In November of 2012, early in the Civil War, using the imagery of our text for this morning, Pastor Ibrahim uh, described how his congregation felt the wind and the waves of storm when Islamic militants bombed their church and destroyed much of the building. On social media, uh, the militants rejoiced that they had destroyed a people who worshipped three gods, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But these Syrian Christians, these Syrian Presbyterians, were not destroyed. In the words of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church, Pastor Ibrahim and his congregation were afflicted in every way, but not crushed. They were perplexed, but not driven to despair. They were persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. In an interview, Pastor Ibrahim said, they, the extremists, thought the church is a building. But the church was never the building. The church is the community, the people. And we know that we are called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And we know that we have a mission in this country. And we're staying. After their church building was destroyed, the Presbyterian congregation of Aleppo continued to hear and act upon the words of Jesus. They rebuilt their church in another part of the city. And on the site where their first building had been, uh, they built the Aleppo Christian Center, a new building uh, for theological training, ecumenical conferences for the region, uh, and the center of community relief efforts in Aleppo. All that on the foundation of their old church. During some of the most difficult years of the war, the congregation persevered. They actually continued to grow. What a growth strategy. As they were deeply involved in those years in what they called salt and light ministries in the Aleppo area. They worshiped joyfully, served faithfully, and witnessed boldly. They drilled three wells for the community so they could have fresh water. They distributed food kits. They extended uh, educational and medical assistance to people regardless of their religious background. Remember, they represent only 2 to 3% of the country's population. The congregation's stated desire was to be a demonstration of kingdom love in the world and to bear witness to their reliance upon Christ as their foundation of hope. But their story continues, continues to this month, February. Earlier this month, the National Presbyterian Church of Aleppo was pounded by yet another unimaginable storm. On February the 6th, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake, as you know, struck southeast Turkey and northeast Syria. And once again, pretty much completely destroyed the National Presbyterian Church building and caused widespread damage throughout Aleppo. Immediately after the earthquake, Pastor Ibrahim and his family ran out of their undamaged home uh, to lead people to safety. Now his congregation is once again drawing on their wealth of experience in hearing and acting upon Jesus' words to give shelter at their Aleppo Christian Center, again, remember, built on the foundation of the first church, to some 600 people, all of various faith traditions. They're also serving food and drink to earthquake survivors in government-created shelters, serving as physical vessels for God's presence amongst those in need, regardless of their religious faith. Pastor Ibrahim and his family are working side by side with their elders and congregants, all to bear witness to Christ. 
Pastor Ibrahim described what motivates their actions. He said this in an interview. He said, Christ said, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. They said, Lord, when did we see you and not help? He said, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. He went on to say, right now, faith is being tested in every sense. We either serve everyone or there is no meaning to this spiritual inheritance we carry with us if it fails to impact positively on society. But that's not all. Pastor Ibrahim has reached out to Christian partners around the world, including Presbyterians just like us, encouraging them to respond to this crisis and to give generously, sharing what they have without any deference to politics or religious persuasion so that everyone may see their good deeds and glorify God in heaven. Sounds like Sermon on the Mount words to me. It has been said that a good sermon ending should include a story and a summons. I've just told you the story of a courageous, faithful people of the National Presbyterian Church of Aleppo. Friends, they are ordinary people. They're not superstars. They're ordinary people. Followers of Jesus who've built a foundation. They are a people who have chosen to persevere in unimaginable circumstances, to persevere in hearing and acting upon the words of the one that they follow. So here's the summons. <laughs> pray. Pray, pray deeply for these, our siblings in Christ. Pastor Ibrahim, his family, the good people of the National Presbyterian Church, of Aleppo, Syria. As you're able, uh, give. Give to earthquake relief through Presbyterian disaster assistance. Information in your bulletin today. And as we go from this place today, may we commit ourselves, individually and collectively, to live our lives to answer this question. Now that we've heard Jesus' words, what must we do to make them the foundation of how we live? May it be so that all honor and glory may be given to the one who has been revealed to us as maker, most blessed redeemer and friend. Amen? May it be so. foundation you saints of the lord is laid for your faith in god's excellent word what more can be said than to you god that said to you who for refuge to jesus have fled Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. For I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be near thee, thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. 
When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though well hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Please join me. We trust in God, whom Jesus, Abba, Father, in sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves. Accept lies as truth. Exploit nature and Yet God and mercy to redeem creation and everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Dear God, thank you for your presence in this place of worship. We come before you with humble hearts and ask that you grant us mercy and forgiveness for our shortcomings. We intercede today for those with heavy hearts, Lord. Hear these prayers of grief, loss, worry, or fear, and bring relief, particularly those who are struggling in Turkey and Syria with their burdens. These burdens overwhelm us at times, but the psalmist reminds us you daily bear our burdens. Jesus tells us when we bring our burdens to him, we find rest for our souls. Grant us rest, peace, and reassurance that we are not alone. We pray for people who struggle with poverty and stable housing. Often, these individuals are cast aside and blamed for their condition. Give us generous hearts and keep keen minds to find solutions for these issues and share your love in a tangible way. We pray for mothers, fathers, and grandparents who struggle to help family members suffering from addiction, mental illness, or other serious illnesses. Open our eyes to these needs around us and help us better serve those in need of hope. We lay these burdens and those not spoken before you, the ultimate healer, and you all things are possible. God of mercy and love, hear our prayers, open our hearts, and heal our brokenness. To God be the glory. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer and stand. Ushers come now to receive the offering. Oh, shortly. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now ushers come and receive the offering.
Gracious God, we do trust in you. And Lord, we place these, our gifts, our offerings, securely in your hands and ask you to bless and multiply these gifts that they may bring blessing to this world that you love so much. We offer them freely with hearts open wide to you. In Christ's name, amen. of God, you have heard the words of Jesus. Now go and live them. And may the blessing of God, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain upon you this day and forevermore. Let God's people together say, Amen. Amen.